the torture and death of a child committed by an entire neighborhood of children culminating in over 150 separate wounds in her autopsy. It was called the most terrible crime ever committed in Indiana. And half a century later, that title still holds. This is the true story of how mob mentality led to the torture and murder of Indiana teen Sylvia Likens. Hello strangers and strangelings, welcome back to the Strange Bar and Grill. I'm serving up another true crime story time. Right now I'm just drinking some coffee because it's early in the morning and I'm not an alcoholic. You know, I can't be driving these kids to school, hitting them school zones like a psycho. So today, I'm just drinking a little coffee and my voice is still. But today I have a throwback video, a video that I recorded on this channel way back when, when I was doing faceless videos. This was before I started beefing with YouTube and before I was forced to show myself, <laughs> I guess. And, and, and I know some of you guys are thinking, yeah, well maybe you should go back to faceless again because making my fucking eyes hurt. Well, to that I say, screw you, screw you. But anyway, this is just one of those stories that has always stuck with me and I just wanted to repost it and share the story again. And plus I just never figured out what YouTube's problem was. So anyway, we'll just upload it again and see what happens. So pull up a chair if you like strange true crime and storytelling, then this is the place to be here with me, JP. So kick back, grab a drink or a snack, and remember to always tip that like button because it helps with the channel. Join the SBG family by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to make sure you're getting notified when I release a weekly video. All right, let's go. The story of Sylvia Likens. It has probably been one of the most enduring nightmares in Indianapolis true crime history. The October 26th, 1965 torment and extermination of 16-year-old Sylvia Likens. Other crimes have involved a greater number of victims, often including children, but the villains in those stories were hardened criminals or madmen and their acts of violence played out rapidly within a span of minutes or hours. In the aftermath of grief and anger, good people could at least comprehend the chain of events that had just unfolded. On the surface, the Lycan's extermination is not much different from any number of heinous crimes. It was a Cinderella story without the happy ending. A teenage girl left under the care of a strict authoritarian whose idea of discipline is physical abuse that escalates until the abuse victim perishes away. If that was the extent of it, this case would likely have been lost to history long ago, like so many other long forgotten murders. This case was somehow more disturbing than other crimes, perhaps because the abuse was carried out not just by the caregiver, the notorious Gertrude Banizewski, but also by her own children, some as young as 10, and by other children in the neighborhood. For weeks, even months, the torment of Sylvia Likens was casual entertainment, something to do in the afternoon before dinner and favorite TV shows. At least a dozen children participated, or at least watched, and none felt sufficiently disturbed to tell their own parents. Other adults occasionally came to the Benazuski house for various reasons and saw Sylvia's battered appearance. None pushed to be sure she was safe. Sylvia herself and her younger sister Jenny had opportunities to tell adults at school or church. They even had adult relatives living nearby. Neither said a word because, as Jenny would later explain, they thought it would only make things worse. Neither could conceive of the possibility that authorities would move to protect them, remove them from the house, or arrest their tormentors. On October 26, 1965, Indianapolis police were called to 3850 East New York Street, where Sylvia's body lay on a mattress. Banizewski told them the girl had been attacked by a gang of boys, and she even produced a note written in Sylvia's own hand that seemed to confirm that story, but the cops could tell by the condition of the victim that this had been no single incident. Sylvia's body was malnourished and covered with sores, burns, and bruises, many of them old. 
she had been branded in one spot by a hot metal object, and the words, I am a prostitute, had been etched on her stomach. Before we go any further, let's go back a little bit, and let's figure out how all this began. Sylvia came from a large, poor family from southern Boone County, just northwest of Indianapolis. Her father, Lester Likens, had only an eighth grade education and worked a lot of different jobs to make a living. He'd had a laundry route, worked in factories, and had even owned a small restaurant, though it was unsuccessful. He had also traveled with carnivals selling food from a concession cart. It was to this work to which he and his wife decided to return in the summer of 1965. That meant finding someone to watch four of their children. The oldest, Diana, was grown and married. The two boys, Danny and Benny, were placed with their grandparents, and that left the girls, Sylvia and Jenny. Jenny was shy, insecure, and limped from childhood polio. Sylvia was outwardly more confident and went by the nickname Cookie. She was pretty, but always kept her mouth closed when she smiled because she had a missing front tooth. A mutual friend introduced the Likens to Gertrude Banevzewski. At the time, she was going by the name Gertrude Wright. She lived in a big rented house at the corner of East New York and Denny and was willing to look after Jenny and Sylvia for $20 a week. Gertrude was already caring for seven of her own children, Paula, 17, John, 12, Stephanie, 15, Marie, 11, Shirley, 10, and James and Dennis, 18 months. The six oldest children all had the same last name as Banazuski because their father was Gertrude's ex-husband, John Banazuski. The youngest child, Dennis, had the last name of his father, Dennis Wright. Gertrude said he was in Germany servicing in the army. From the beginning, there was a clash between Sylvia and Gertrude's 17-year-old daughter, Paula. And this was the seed of what grew in that house during the months of July through October 1965. Then one day, the money order from Sylvia's parents didn't show up on the day Gertrude was expecting it. Jenny later testified Gertrude took us upstairs and she slapped me and said, well, I took care of you two bitches for a week for nothing. The money order arrived the next day, but the craziness has already started. Gertrude was frail and underweight, but she had two weapons she used for corporal punishment, a fraternity style paddle and a thick leather belt left behind by her ex-husband, John Banazuski, an Indianapolis police officer. Gertrude began using the paddle on Sylvia and Jenny for various offenses, such as exchanging soft drink bottles for change at a nearby grocery. When she suspected Sylvia of stealing, she used matches to burn the girl's fingers. Sometimes Gertrude felt too weak from her asthma to discipline the girls properly, so 17-year-old Paula helped. Neighborhood children began to crowd the home to participate in the torment. The children took turns practicing their judo on Sylvia, hurling her against the wall. Some began kicking and beating her. Others extinguished their cigarettes on her skin. As Gertrude and a gang of teenagers watched, Sylvia was forced to undress in the living room and insert an empty Coke bottle into her vagina. After the beatings, Sylvia was forced into a scalding hot bath so she would be cleansed of her sins. She was severely beaten and burned for wetting her mattress while asleep, and Gertrude decided that Sylvia was no longer fit to live with her children. Near the end, Sylvia was no longer permitted to leave the house. She was thrown down the cellar stairs and locked in, given crackers for food, and refused the right to use a bathroom. Gertrude Banazuski announced to her children that Sylvia was a prostitute and she's proud of it, so we'll just put it on her stomach. She took a large needle and began to carve the words, I'm a prostitute and proud of it, into Sylvia's stomach. Richard Hobbs, a neighbor boy, finished the etching. When Banazuski 
realized Sylvia might be dying, she forced her to write a note saying a gang of boys beat her. The plan was to blindfold her and dump her in a nearby woods with the note. Sylvia tried to escape, but Gertrude and one of the boys stopped her, beating her again and throwing her back into the basement. Sylvia Likens died October 26, 1965. Cause of death was determined to be brain swelling, internal hemorrhaging of the brain, and shock induced by Sylvia's extensive skin damage. Sylvia also suffered from extreme malnutrition. She was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery in Lebanon. This is a truly, truly screwed up story. Um, what this woman did to this teenage girl, she even had her own children joining in under the torment of this woman, this young woman. I find it to be utterly disgusting. She had the neighborhood children join in. This is Reminds me of the Lord of the Flies type book where everyone is just unruly and this mob mentality and they're just doing this evil, evil shit to people. Um, truly disgusting. The one thing that makes this different from the Lord of the Flies is that there's an actual adult here who's commanding them to do this, these horrible things to Sylvia. In the Lord of the Flies book, it was just children. It wasn't adults there telling people to do these horrible things. Disgusting. We're very, very sick. The Banaszewski Trial, May 1966. At her trial the following year, Banaszewski denied any knowledge of the torture, claiming the children must have done it all. She'd enter pleas of not guilty and not guilty by the reason of insanity. On May 19th, 1966, a jury found Banaszewski guilty of first-degree murder, while Paula Banaszewski was found guilty of second-degree murder. Hobbs, along with Banaszewski's son, John, and another neighborhood boy, Coy Hubbard, were convicted of manslaughter. Gertrude and Paula Banaszewski were sentenced to life terms at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. The boys were sentenced to two to 21 year terms at the Indiana State Reformatory in Pendleton. In 1971, the Indiana Supreme Court granted Gertrude and Paula Banaszewski a new trial due to prejudicial atmosphere, but Gertrude was again convicted of first degree murder on August 5th, 1971. <laughs> good, good. She, she, she fucking deserved it. Paula pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter and served about two years in prison. What the hell? Only two years in prison? Jesus. The three boys were released on parole for good behavior in 1968 after serving about two years each of their sentences. Now, I will say that the children, they probably wouldn't have done any of this disgusting sick stuff if their mother hadn't made them. Um, but, but, Given the circumstances, these boys' lives are changed forever, them, forever themselves. Um, they'll probably never be the same. I mean, what they did was some sick, twisted stuff. Yeah, the, the mother corrupted her whole family. In December 1985, Gertrude Banaszewski was released on parole. She changed her name to Nadine Van Fossen and moved to Iowa where she lived in obscurity until her death from lung cancer on June 16, 1990. Paula married and moved to a farm in Iowa. Her husband should run for his damn life. John became a lay minister in Texas and counseled children of divorced parents. Hobbs died of cancer at the age of 21, four years after being released from the reformatory. Hubbard has had several brushes with the law Lester and Betty Likens divorced. Betty remarried and died in 1998 at the age of 71. Jenny Likens Wade died in 2004 at the age of 54. 